This is going to be Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to talk about warnings from a warrior. We know the Lord is a man of war. And he's given a lot of warnings in this chapter. In Matthew 7, 28, it says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. So he taught, when he taught, he taught as one having authority. You see, he was the word of God. And he is the word of God. So he can speak with authority. You've got the word of God. So when you're speaking, using it, you can speak with authority. But the messages from the Lord Jesus Christ were with authority. And it was like truth bombs going off right in front of the hearers. You know how... There are times when your pastor's preaching and he says something that just hits so hard and you can feel it. It's like you could just feel it like a bomb dropping on you. That's the way it is when you use the actual words of God. And the reason that like the TV preachers and stuff don't have that is because they don't use the words of God. The power's in the words. And that's how every word that Jesus Christ said would have been. It would have been like a bomb going off. Because everything he said would have been the word of God. In Exodus 15, 3, it says, The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. So he is a warrior. And he is our captain. So listen to these warnings from a warrior. The first thing he warns about is judgment. In Matthew 7, 1, it says, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. So Jesus is preaching that the same way you judge others, you'll get judged. With what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. Many men are afraid to warn you of a judgment in your future, but Jesus Christ was not. Uh, men do not want to talk about hell. They don't want to talk about a coming great white throne judgment or a coming judgment seat of Christ. But Jesus Christ isn't afraid to do so. Uh, in Hebrews 9.27, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. But in Matthew 7, 1 through 5, isn't a warning that you shouldn't judge anyone. It's actually a warning against hypocritical judgment. In Matthew 7, 3, it says, Why beholdest the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? For example, don't judge your brother for being a compulsive liar when you're the biggest gossip in town. That is hypocritical judgment. How can you take the mote out of your brother's eye when you have a big beam right there in your own eye that you need surgically removed? How can you say something to your brother about smoking cigarettes when you are the biggest backbiter in your whole church? He says in verse 4, How wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast the mote out of thy brother's eye. You can't see clearly enough to help your brother until you get the beam out of your eye. But hypocrites are worried about the little speck of sawdust in everybody else's eye, and those things can be got out with the tip of their finger. You see, the, the person doing hypocritical judgment, they forgot about the large beam sticking out of their eye. That's going to take a whole mo lot more preparation and work to remove. You see, the Lord is giving you a warning. He's warning of hypocritically judging others. But remember, we need to examine. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, and judge ourselves in 1 Corinthians 11.31. We're going to judge angels in 1 Corinthians 6.3. So it makes sense that we should be able to judge the smallest matters in 1 Corinthians 6.2, as it talks about. You know, judging is something we should do. It just shouldn't be hypocritical judgment. You see, that's the warning. And skip down to verse 21, and the Lord Jesus gives a terrifying warning against false prophets and how they will be judged. You see, this is the judgment that people really don't want to talk about. 
you know, a lot of people will talk about, you know, don't judge others, no problem. But when it comes to this type of judgment here, they don't want to give you this warning. In Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not everybody that says Lord is the real deal. A lot of people are in this just for the filthy lucre. It says in Titus 1.11, Whose mouths must be stopped to subvert all houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. They're just doing it for the money. And in Matthew 7.22, it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. They may have power to do many wonderful works, but so did Pharaoh's magicians in Exodus 7.11. So did Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8.11. The false prophet's going to be able to call down fire from heaven in Revelation 13.13-14. 13, 13 through 14. He's going to deceive with many, with power and signs and lying wonders. The Antichrist is, as it talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2. In Matthew 7.23, it says, And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Notice the Lord says, depart from me. Imagine being judged before Jesus Christ and hearing the dreadful words, depart from me. In Matthew 25, 41, it says, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He says to those false prophets that think they've done many wonderful works, he says, I never knew you. Now, doctrinally, this could never be me and you. You see, a lot of people are going to make you think by using this verse that you can lose your salvation. But no matter what you do, he could never look at you and say, I never knew you. Because if you're saved, then you are known of God. In Galatians 4, 9, it says, But now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. You see, you're known of God. He could never say, I never knew you. So don't be caught standing before God without doing the will of the Father, you see. You see, these people had not had not done the will of the Father. It says in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Well, what is the will of the Father? In John six forty, it says, This is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him, many may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. What's the will of the Father? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But the warrior warns about judgment to come. And he also warns about false prophets. These same false prophets we've been talking about. He's going to give us a really good warning. You see this Jesus Christ. I know that a lot of people don't like to have pictures of Jesus. But I mean it's just something to remind you of Jesus here. I don't know what he looked like. I, he definitely probably didn't look like this guy. Probably a lot, a lot more rough looking, tough looking. But you see all these warriors. I thought the picture was cool. Got all these warriors around him bowing down to him. Because he's the ultimate warrior. He's the captain of our salvation. And see all the greatest warriors all throughout the history of time. If they had any sense would bow down to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's going to warn against false prophets here. And he's already got into these guys who do many wonderful works in his name, yet they're nothing but posers. But looking back at verse 6, it says in Matthew 7, 6, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So who are the dogs and the swine? Well, false prophets are likened to dogs and pigs. In 2 Peter 2, 22, it says, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow to, that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So, Second Peter 2, 1 shows the context of that chapter of Second Peter 2, 22, and that is false prophets. It says in Second Peter 2, 1, but there were false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So when it says, Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. The warning doesn't have to do with giving the gospel to lost people. 
You see, many men teach that this has to do with people taking the gospel to certain lost people and, and them just trampling it under their feet. This can't be true because the gospel is the only hope for lost people. You can't just say, well, I'm not giving this person the gospel because they may, you know, trample it under their feet and then turn again and hurt me. That's not what the, that can't be what this means. In Romans 1 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is powerful. Uh, you don't have to worry about them tr trampling on the gospel. It's much more powerful than them. The gospel is the power of God. It has the power to transform any lost sinner that will believe. And in light of scripture with scripture, the dogs and the swine are false prophets. And in light of the context, Matthew seven fifteen through 20, the dogs and, and swine are false prophets. So don't give that which is holy to the dogs, the false prophets, and don't cast your pearls before the swine. Once again, false prophets. So what is that which is holy and what are the pearls? Well, in Romans 12, 1, it says we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy. So there is a sense that you can still sin and still be considered living holy because the holiest you've ever lived in your life, you were still sinning in some way. And when it comes to your soul being in Christ, then it's always holy, perfectly holy without sin. So if you're saved and in Christ, you're holy. So don't give yourself over to false prophets. Paul talks about holy scriptures in 2 Timothy 3.15. Don't put false prophets in charge of feeding you with that which is holy. See? Cast not your pearls before swine. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Don't put the dogs in charge of the holy, giving you the holy scriptures. Don't put the dogs in charge of the holy saints. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.27 talks about holy brethren. Don't recommend false prophets to your friends. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.26 talks about an holy kiss. Don't be greeting the enemy and bidding them Godspeed, giving them an holy kiss. It would just end up in spiritual adultery. And the pearls could be the church. Again, the kingdom, of, it says in Ma uh, Matthew 13, 45 through 46, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchantman seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Jesus Christ left the riches of heaven and came down and bought the church with his own blood. That was the pearl of great price. Uh, keep the false prophets and wolves out of the church. The context shows that it's referring to false prophets. And then if you look down at Matthew seven fifteen, it even says in the same chapter, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Look at the word beware. Remember, false prophets are dogs. It says, beware of false prophets. And Paul says that same phrase, but uses the word dogs instead in Philippians 3, 2. Beware of dogs. Beware of false prophets. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. You see, the, these false prophets came to you in sheep's clothing. They pretend to be something they are not. So the Lord Jesus Christ, you got a warning from the warrior, the Lord, beware of false prophets. So it makes sense that these people's words would be fake because they pretend to be something they're not. There were false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth is shall be evil spoken of and through covetousness shall they with feigned words pretend words make a merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not in romans sixteen eighteen, for they that are such serve not our lord jesus christ but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple that's how the false prophet attacks you is with good words and fair speeches. You don't even see it coming. 
So Matthew seven fifteen, the warning from a warrior, beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. That is why you don't want to turn the holy brethren and the holy scriptures over to a false prophet, because these wolves want to kill the flock. In Acts twenty twenty nine, it says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. They're only out for their self. They're out for money, a little bit of fame, and whatever they can get for themselves. When the shepherd sees a wolf coming, he needs to get rid of it. In John ten twelve it says, But he that is an hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. You see, a good shepherd will teach the flock the right Bible doctrine, and then expose the wrong doctrine. Doctrine has become a thing of the past in most churches. So the shepherd and the sheep will let the wolf walk right in the front door. In John 21, 16, Jesus told Peter to feed my sheep. The word is to be fed, and most pastors are starving the sheep. And when the wolf comes, they're weak from fasting for 40 years. It's like when Saul got all those, all of them to fast, and they were weak. Uh, they've been in a spiritual famine of hearing the words of God. Now it's about the music. And I don't just mean the contemporary stuff, but music in general. That's the focus, is on the music. There's more focus on, you know, to technique or delivery or entertainment and, and emotional things that more than that than there is on the Bible. If you look at, at, you know, at the average church service, it's more, it's a focus on these things. And they say, well, we'll, we'll bore the people if we don't have all these things. Well, you're not. You're not helping the. You're not helping them by keeping them entertained. You're helping them by giving them the Bible, and I mean, if you've been entertaining them for for a long for years, wean them off the entertainment. Start giving them Bible doctrine. But if you if you look at the average church service, that's all it is. It's 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 entertainment, trying to entertain people. There's no Bible doctrine anymore. Because they think the Bible doctrine is just going to bore people. Well, it's like, you know, you give a kid can a bunch of candy. If I give my son a bunch of candy before dinner time, he's not going to eat the dinner. He doesn't want the meat. He just wants the sweets. Or if I just give him glass after glass after glass of milk, <clears throat> well, sippy cup after sippy cup of milk, he's not going to want the dinner. He got full off the milk. And all these things aren't bad. I'm not saying music's bad. Obviously not. The technique, delivery, entertainment. I don't think entertainment's bad. And all these things are not bad. But all this stuff usually takes the place in front of doctrine. And these things aren't bad. But I, I can lean on the truth of the Bible. I can't lean on all this other stuff. You know, a heart-steering song gets you emotional for a few minutes, but the Word of God sets up in your heart and it stays there. You know, you can hear an emotional song that's a really good song, and it'll make you feel emotional or guilty, or not guilty, but convicted for a few minutes, but it doesn't stay. But when the Word of God sets up in your heart, it's like it stays there because see, remember the powers is in the the powers in the words. In Matthew seven fifteen through sixteen, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by the fruits. Do men grow the grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? You shall know who by their fruits. The false prophets. A lot of people will ignore the context and teach we need to examine everyone's fruit to determine if that person is saved or not. But that won't work because good fruits can be counterfeited. A false prophet is going to put on a public display of good works to deceive you. That's why he's a wolf in sheep's clothing, a devil inhabiting someone's body, but appearing as a minister of righteousness. That's what he appears as. I mean, the devil's a counterfeiter. He's going to counterfeit good things, good works. 
He transforms into an angel of light, remember? In Matthew seven seventeen it says, And so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Just like the devil, he's a corrupt tree. In Ezekiel 31, 9, it says, The other trees in the garden of God envied him. See, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And if you apply this to yourself in the sense of your salvation, then it would mean none of us are saved. If you say you're saved and are therefore a good tree, and that that, that would mean that you can't bring forth evil fruit, then that's a very wrong interpretation because you know that you bring forth evil fruit sometimes. So if it, say, if it says a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, and you say, well, I'm saved and I'm a good tree, so I don't bring forth evil fruit, you're just lying to yourself. If that's the way you're interpreting the verse because you know that you're still evil. But the tree, you see, the tree that doesn't bring forth good fruit is cast into the fire. So you say you're saved and you're a good tree. Well, you can't be if, if you're still doing bad things, if you're still doing evil things. You see, the, the one that the tree that brings forth the, the bad fruit, they're getting cast into the fire. But let me explain this to you, what's going on here. Paul made it clear that a born-again Christian, even himself, can do evil. So is Paul a corrupt tree because he can still do evil? Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Are you determining your salvation off which tree you're, you might be? You see, I'm going to show you why it's wrong to determine your salvation on these verses here. Or to look at someone and say, well, they're doing bad. They don't have good fruit. They don't have good works. So they're a corrupt tree. Therefore, they're lost. Or are you looking at somebody and saying, well, they're a good tree. Because they are having good fruit and have good works. You can't look at it that way. Because Paul himself said in Romans seven nineteen through 21, For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. So you can't go to Matthew seven eighteen to prove that if a person has fruit, then he's really saved. But if he doesn't have fruit, then he's really lost. You see, that's not going to work. Because Paul said, when I would do good, evil is present with me. Paul was still a sinner. He said, he's the, he said, I'm the least of all saints. He said, I'm the chief of sinners. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So if you're going to just determine your salvation by Matthew 17, 18 through 20, then you, you can either be a good tree or a corrupt tree. The good tree can't bring forth evil fruit. Now think about it for a minute. In your Christian life, since you've been saved, have you brought forth evil fruit? You have. So by your by your uh, interpretation, you would then be a corrupt tree and not a good one. But you see, it doesn't work that way. You have to remember you have a standing in state. You have to remember that you got two natures. You got the flesh and the spirit. You got the old man and the new man. Remember that. You see, the new man is the good tree. That's what's born of God. What's The thing that's born of God in you is what can't bring forth evil fruit. Your flesh is not a good tree. It would be a corrupt tree. And it does not bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's not the new man in you. It's not going to be cast into the fire. So it says, Wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. And see, if you're just going around examining everyone's fruit to determine if they're saved or not, you see, you don't know if that person is living 
for their good tree, which is the new man, or if they're living for the corrupt tree, the flesh. When it comes to me and you, that's the only way that we can look at these verses for me and you today. Because I got the new man in me, it, it can't sin, it's perfect. But my flesh, it's going to sin every day in some way. Some ways I'm probably not even knowing about, obviously. So if you apply this to yourself and your salvation, then it would mean none of us are saved. Because you're not just some big perfect tree that doesn't bring ever bring forth evil fruit. You know, you have to look at it and taking into consideration your standing versus your state, the old man versus the new man. The old man still sins, the new man can't sin. You have to look at it considering that. You can't just say, well, this person's lost because they don't have good fruits, this person's saved because they do have good fruits. But this is these are warnings from a warrior, and the next thing he's going to warn about is that man is evil. In Matthew 7, 7, it says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Maybe if you would ask, seek, and knock, then you would get what you're wanting. In 1 John 5, 14, it says, And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, <coughs> he heareth us. And James 4, 2, it says, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have. And could not obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. In Matthew 7, 8, it says, For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. I mean, you have to use your common sense here and compare Scripture with sh Scripture. You know, God's not acting as your own personal genie. You can't just ask him and expect it to happen and happen right then. But if you ask and you seek and knock and you're praying the right kind of prayer, then he's going to answer it and in his time. In Matthew 7, 9, Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? You see, just like if a son asks his father for food, is he going to give him rocks or something that he can't even eat, that's not even edible? In Matthew 7, 10, If he shall ask a fish, or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you ask your Heavenly Father for food, do you think he's going to give you something that's going to hurt you? Notice this, Matthew seven eleven. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good thanks to them that ask him? If earthly fathers who are evil know how to give good gifts to their children, do you think the Father in heaven doesn't know how to give you what you need? Notice the things mentioned are things you need to survive food and with food and raiment let us be there with content also remember that jesus is talking to the disciples here and not the pharisees and he called them evil the bible says in romans 3 10 there is none righteous no not one romans 3 23 for all of sin comes short of the glory of god psalm 39 5 man in his best state is altogether vanity paul said oh wretched man that i am man is evil but if you have the righteousness of jesus christ on your soul then it's as holy as Jesus Christ. So you're not going to be one of these corrupt trees that gets cast into the fire because you got the blood on your soul. So no matter what you've done, you can't lose your salvation. You're in no danger of being told, I never knew you because he does know you. But this warning, the warnings from a warrior, he doesn't cease to warn about hell fire. In Matthew seven twelve, it says, Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Think about it. If you treated everyone you meet just like you wanted to be treated, there would be no problem. Most of what God tells us to do has to do with being good to each other. In Romans thirteen eight through 9, it says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. If you treated everyone like you wanted to be treated, love your neighbor like you love yourself, then you're not going to commit adultery. You're not going to kill him. You're not going to steal from him. You're not going to lie to him or covet their stuff. You see? Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. 
Now the warrior with the warnings is going to get into hellfire. Matthew 7, 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. The road to hell has good music, good food, immodestly dressed women. You got the bad boy type men, the sex, the drugs, the pills. You might imagine it looking like Las Vegas. Amusement parks, parades, fairs, vacations, things like that. It might even have a big funny looking open mouth like the entrance at that Travis Scott concert, you know, where they all, you know, about suffocated to death and said that it was like they were in hell because they were so packed up on each other. But Jesus said, many there be which go in there at. People are tramping, trampling over one another on their way to hell. It's a wide and it's broad. So there are many ways to get in. Many people are headed down that road. But, but he said, entering at the straight gate. That means it's narrow. It's not wide. It isn't hard to go down this way. You just have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the only way. But it isn't a broad way because there's only one way in. And there also isn't as many people going in this way. It says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Believe on Jesus Christ and it will put you on the right way automatically and you can't ever get lost or turned around. But if you're not saved, you're already on the broad way to destruction. You're on your way to hellfire. And the warning from a warrior is, don't go to hell. The war warning from the warrior is, build on the right foundation. It says in Matthew seven twenty four. therefore, Whatsoever, whosoever heareth these things of mine and doeth them, I will liken him to a wise man which put his house upon a rock. Jesus Christ is the rock. First Peter two eight calls him a stone of stumbling and rock of offense. First Corinthians ten four refers to Moses giving the children of Israel water out of the rock, and it says that rock was Christ. The moment you believe the gospel, you will build your house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, but for it was founded upon a rock. If you're on the rock, then the rain, and the floods, and the wind can never knock the house over. It says in Matthew seven twenty six, And every one that heareth these things of mine, and doeth them, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which put his house upon the sand. Those who are going down the broad way have their house built in the sand. They're just waiting on destruction. It says, And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. You're headed for a fall. Pride goes before destruction, and haughty spirit before a fall. If you have too much pride to get on the rock, then you're going to fall and be burned in the fire, buried in it. A lot of people are good and moral, but they aren't saved. They're building a building with all of these good works, but they are doing it on the wrong foundation. If you aren't building on the right foundation, which is Jesus Christ, then you won't even make it to the judgment seat of Christ to have those good works to even be looked at. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. When you got saved, you got the right foundation. And then through your whole Christian life, you're building something on that foundation, building something that you're going to offer to Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ. So you've got the right foundation. You've got the warning built on the right foundation. You listen to that advice. Now, start building with the right stuff.